Hello and welcome. My name is Captain David Wong. I'm a pediatrician and chief medical officer at the HHS Office of Minority Health. I want to thank all of you for attending today's session, which is on sustainable um, financing models for community health workers. And this is a very special OMH brown bag because this event essentially serves as a kickoff for a new OMH priority on CHW financing, which is being directed under the leadership of Rear Admiral Felicia Collins, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health and our OMH Director, as well as David Johnson, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Regional Health Operations. And as, as I think many of you know, CHW work is not new to OMH. We've been working in this space for many years. We have current projects now with community health workers and public housing. We're collaborating with Indian Health Service on some of their community health aid program activities. And previously, we have done several initiatives involving Promotora de Salud. Um, but this new intentional focus on CHW financing is something that we want to bring to the table moving forward. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that this new priority fits squarely under the OMH overarching goal, as Rear Admiral Collins has coined it, S3P3 or S cube P cube. And that stands for all OMH goals and activities should really move towards advancing the success, sustainability, and spread. Those are the three S's of health disparity reducing programs, policies, and practices. And those are the three Ps. And so um, with this event, you know, our question kind of moving forward is, what can OMH do with our partners and invited guests uh, to really advance the needle for ensuring that community health workers, this very critical workforce for serving racial ethnic minority populations and community of color, particularly during COVID, and beyond, how can we ensure that this workforce is sustainable? So I'm very pleased to open this today's session. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to my esteemed colleague, um, Ms. Georgia Simpson, who will be moderating today's event. Thank you again for attending. Thank you, Captain Wong. Uh, and hello, everyone. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items. Uh, you'll see that the audience will be muted for the duration and only our speakers will be on camera. Uh, please use the chat feature to ask your questions, and I will present them on your behalf during the dedicated Q&A session. Also, please include who the question is intended for. So, my name is Georgia Simpson, and I'm the Regional Minority Health Analyst in OASH Region 1, New England. I would like to welcome you again to the OMH Brown Bag on Sustainable Financing for Community Health Workers. I will serve as your moderator for today's event, and it is truly an honor to do so. I have had the good fortune to work with community health workers for several decades, and I get to witness the incredible passion and dedication they bring to their work. Whether it's infant mortality prevention and ensuring that women have access to early prenatal care, HIV counseling and testing and services beyond that, or as Dr. Wong mentioned, at the intersection of health and housing and ensuring that they're elevating for our knowledge, those social determinants of health that are really impacting or influencing what is happening locally. CHWs, as many of you know, are the bridge that connects communities that are hardly reached to the social and healthcare services needed to maintain health, well-being, and to thrive. So it comes as no surprise that they have been called by many a courageous and special people. And I do call them that as well. So today's topic is so important because sustainable financing is essential to community health workers doing what they do best. As your moderator, I have the awesome task of introducing our amazing group of speakers who are national experts in the community health worker movement. Denise Octavia Smith is the executive director of the National Association of Community Health Workers, also known as NATRA, and she will provide an overview of CHWs and financing. Following Denise, we have Gail Hirsch, former director for the Office of Community Health Workers at the Massachusetts Department of 
Public Health, and she'll speak about building CHW sustainability in Massachusetts. Following Gail will be The presenters will be joined by Anna Bartels, Director of Clinical to Community Connections at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, also known as ASTO, and who will contribute what ASTO's policy perspectives are to the conversation. So without further delay, Denise, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Georgia, David, Rear Admiral Collins, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor uh, as a CHW and a patient navigator uh, to represent the National Association of Community Health Workers as its founding ED and to speak with you for a few moments on uh, some characteristics of our workforce, as well as some problems, principles, and possibilities towards sustainable financing. Next slide, please. I always like to begin a conversation by just putting into historical context uh, the way in which the community health worker uh, approach has really uh, been born and is uh, what it has come to be known now in the United States. Um, whether we are talking about uh, the lands that were uh, ceded through treaties from indigenous populations um, as uh, a way uh, in, in exchange for guarantees uh, to access health care, education, and other services, but yet we find that indigenous populations uh, across almost every indicator languish in low life expectancy and high rates of chronic disease or death. Uh, whether we are talking about the landmark study uh, of W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, his articulation of the way in which uh, structural racism creates barriers to the social drivers of well being uh, in the late 1800s, or whether we look at a variety of other sort of milestones including uh, the OMH's own birth uh, through the Heckler Report, um, really um, calling on the United States to wage an assault on health disparities among black and minority populations. The United States is truly on a long road to equity. I don't think we need another study to clarify or confirm the extent to which uh, up to 80% of what impacts health and well-being uh, does not happen in a doctor's office does not include a medical treatment or a prescription, but it is in fact the social drivers of well-being that are critical and necessary uh, for, uh, for populations to um, access uh, those services um, that they prefer uh, and those that help them achieve their own, uh, their own health goals. Next slide, please. It is within this context of a highly diverse uh, populations across the United States uh, rural and urban, uh, numerous different identities, uh, hundreds of languages uh, within which the community health worker approach in the United States is born. And so whether we are talking about CHWs delivering diapers, uh, whether we are talking about uh, including and expanding vaccine access or distribution of masks, whether uh, CHWs are helping people access their electronic health records and engage in primary care, uh, whether we are conducting street uh, HIV testing, as I did for uh, many years in Hartford, Connecticut, or whether we are uh, uh, mobilizing community members uh, to build capacity to self-advocate uh, and to move policy uh, that helps transform uh, community resiliency and allows community assets to be well-nourished again so that families can achieve well-being. Uh, CHWs are very much at the forefront of uh, on this road to equity of achieving a racial e uh, equity and well-being. Next slide, please. Uh, however, it is very much the case that community health workers are a precarious workforce. We are disproportionately female, not exclusively. Uh, we are peers, meaning we are people who have experienced homelessness. We are people living with HIV. We are those living with and surviving uh, chronic disease or cancer. Um, we are formally incarcerated, right? And it is that shared lived experience that, it, that allows us to center uh, trust 
um, because we know, right, in many instances, we have traversed these barriers across sectors and silos, uh, and we are now drawing from that experience uh, to lift others up in our community. We live and work in under-resourced communities, and so we know well uh, the administrative uh, barriers and the hurdles uh, across silos and sectors that individuals and families will face. Um, and increasingly, we are working in every sector, in education, in housing, uh, behavioral health, primary care, and a variety of uh, social services. I'll, I'll talk in a few moments a little bit more about how we are funded, but I think it's important here just to stress that uh, the CHW approach is very much holistic. As I mentioned, uh, it has sort of been advanced um, before perhaps even the science that CHWs are predominantly focusing on the social drivers of well-being because we know that that is upstream prevention um, and that allows people to thrive uh, in their communities and in a variety of settings. And that's really what we're looking to do is build that capacity. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to share just a couple of uh, data points so that you can get a window into the membership of the National Association. Uh, we were launched in April 2019 uh, as a 501c3, so we're a young organization. We have membership across 48 states, and I came on as the founding ED in November 2019. As you can see here, um, our CHW members are working in a variety of areas in the clinic, uh, conducting research, uh, conducting home visits, uh, navigating across services, and we have a variety of uh, areas of expertise. Uh, including a variety of gender-specific uh, health education, prevention, and engagement uh, activities, as well as uh, upstream social drivers like immigration, housing, and basic needs. Next slide, please. I want to emphasize here that of the national membership, uh, and as this has been confirmed by other data, the majority of community health workers, uh, promotoras, community health representatives, are not working in local or state health departments are not working at FQHCs, are not working through health plans or hospitals. The vast majority of us are still rooted in community-based organizations and nonprofits. And this is important as we pivot the conversation to sustainable financing and funding, uh, because it, what it means is we have to create new consistent streams of funding to reach where promotores, where CHWs and CHRs are actually working and engaging individuals. Next slide, please. So despite over 60 years of evidence on CHW effectiveness across a variety of different uh, chronic disease uh, prevention and care programs, uh, over uh, $275 million invested on comparative effectiveness research through the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute a landmark labor classification with the U.S. Department of Labor, um, movement on CHW policy across dozens of states over uh, almost 20 years, um, and of course the Biden administration's call uh, in, in terms of the national strategy for COVID to center uh, community health workers. CHWs still lack national professional identity. Uh, we are not often integrated into a policy development and leadership, and our organizations languish for lack of uh, sustainable financing. Next slide, please. So in the last two or three minutes, uh, I just want to say that the problems um, are very evident. Uh, our funding remains fragmented. It is still disease focused. It is still siloed, uh, primary care, behavioral health. Um, when we know that we have to take a holistic approach to people's health and well-being, and it is often short-term grant funding. It lacks strategy, um, and so uh, employers often face difficulty articulating the ROI of uh, CHW work. We have inconsistent inclusion of uh, CHW services uh, in our Medicaid uh, and managed care programs, and funding streams often don't exist for a variety of non-medical uh, social needs services that we provide, and funding remains inequitable. In other words, it cannot be accessed by the majority of community-based organizations where CHWs and promotors work. Next slide, please. 
I know there's a lot here, but I trust that the slides will be uh, shared uh, with each of you. So finally, as I just sort of close, I want to talk about some possibilities. The possibility is for the United States uh, to finally reconcile that we need to address the needs of the whole person as, as much as we can upstream and build capacity of people to not be dependent on downstream services, uh, but really to self-advocate and navigate services and systems uh, to, to thrive and achieve their well-being goals. Uh, we, that means supporting the full range of CHW roles. Again, not just downstream deliverers of service, but upstream actors to build capacity and advocacy to conduct research, et cetera. We need our approach to be strategic. Addressing the social determinants is key. We need to pivot from short-term funding. And even now, NACHWA is helping engaging states and federal agencies uh, around short-term COVID funding uh, so that that funding can pivot to nourish and build CHW state associations, drive uh, national and state professional identity, and develop career ladders so that CHWs can remain experts in their community over the many decades and bring that expertise across the systems and services. And then finally, we know that the funding must be equitable. We have to eliminate the professional bias, the professional barriers that often exclude CHW expertise and leadership. That can include uh, issues around certification or licensure. And we have to make sure that investments um, are done in a way that can deeply reach into community-based organizations where the majority of CHWs are. I leave you with the final slide, which is that NACHWA launched a national policy platform uh, in February 2022 to uh, respond directly to the COVID pandemic. Hundreds of CHWs and public and private institutions contributed to this document, and I offer it to you. There are a variety of recommendations uh, around policy there so that public and private institutions can respect, protect, and authentically partner with our workforce. Thank you so much for the brief time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Denise. Um, now we'll hear from Gail. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for including me in this uh, esteemed panel that, that's gathered here today. Uh, I, I'm I'm uh, coming to you from the Massachusetts Office of Community Health Workers, which is located at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, and yeah, as you can see, I'm a founding board member of NACHWA as well. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what I'm gonna try to get across is the main point of how we how we did this in Massachusetts um, and and that we're not quite there yet uh, because where is there there? There is, in a way, there is no there there uh, until we really kind of uh, put in place a lot of pieces. And I chose this title, We Made the Road by Walking It, because I've been doing this work for close to 30 years at the state level and um, and we didn't know what we were doing. OK, so like a lot of the sort of blueprint that that we're able to lay out for you now wasn't available at the time. So um, what I'm going to be talking about is again what we did, where we're at now and where we're headed. Next slide, please. So uh, I was so bold as to uh, to at least articulate what we find has been needed that that has fallen into place for us in Massachusetts with all the work we've done uh, to build the, the, the infrastructure for sustainable financing for community health workers. Denise touched on so much that's critical. So um, I'm, I'm gonna be very brief with this, but I think it's, it's probably, and it may not be the case for all states, but I think these are important considerations for everyone that's thinking about this issue. Um, it, at the state level, uh, a CHW definition, um, and a lot of these things are in place now nationally as well, and some of the work that I've been involved with nationally. Core competencies, which is a recognized body of knowledge for the profession. 
uh, a CHW association in Massachusetts is Nachua, nationally it's Nachua. Uh, a state infrastructure for uh, CHWs that we have at the Department of Public Health that at this point is uh, supported with CDC funding, which is absolutely terrific. We couldn't be doing our work without it. Um, <clears throat> voluntary certification, which is grounded in core competencies. We do workforce surveillance where we track the workforce. Who are they? What are they doing? What are the impacts of certification, training needs, and financing trends? We have a code of ethics in Massachusetts that was established by the state association. And we have a scope of practice, which was uh, established in regulation by our board of certification. And all of these things building towards financing, which is financing beyond CHW salaries, but for workforce infrastructure and all the work that has to be in place. If you threw money at salaries without all the rest of this stuff, it would be a failure and it wouldn't get us to where we want to be going with transformation of the of the system. Next slide, please. So just quickly with health department leadership, uh, we've funded outreach since the 1960s through our anti-poverty work at the department. We uh, view community health workers as a key response to HIV AIDS and infant mortality disparities in the late 80s and early 90s. We formed a CHW task force for the entire agency to better define and support the workforce. And we developed a definition for CHWs in Massachusetts that actually was developed before APHA developed uh, theirs. Um, we uh, invested in training across the state in Massachusetts, and that was proved critical because we were able to convene key partners then and build consensus on core competencies. Next slide, please. Uh, a lot of the work that happened in the early 2000s was around organizing and aligning. And, um, and this all proved so important. I'm not sure we knew what we were doing at the time, but we just, <laughs> we moved forward with it. Uh, we were able to procure uh, an infrastructure grant from HRSA in, uh, in, er in the early 2000s that seeded the establishment of our CHW network to ensure a CHW voice in all the work. We surveyed the workforce and supervisors. We developed contract policy for our community-based vendors uh, around training and supervision. And all of this was done against the backdrop of, of, of alignment with uh, APHA, with the Department of Labor Standard Occupational Classification and uh, with the uh, Affordable Care Act inclusion of community health workers. And um, CHWs were included in Massachusetts health reform in two, 2006 through advocacy by the CHW Association. Okay, uh, next slide, please. There was a policy partnership that led to 34 recommendations in these four categories. Uh, next slide, please. I see I don't have much time left. We developed certification, and this helps to codify the, uh, the uh, definition, the core competencies, all the things I mentioned before, and it laid the foundation for the partnership with MassHealth, which is our state Medicaid program. So next slide, please. So our next... Our, our, uh, what we're doing now is working in partnership with MassHealth, which I believe was really uh, ready to talk to us because we had put in place all that infrastructure. And, um, and through a partnership and significant investments by MassHealth in a, through our current waiver in CHW core competency training, training for supervisors, technical assistance for employers, creation of a supervisor curriculum. We also have 800 uh, CHWs who are certified uh, in Massachusetts, and, um, and that's laying the foundation for the inclusion of CHWs into team-based care in ACOs. Uh, next slide, please. And so our next waiver application is being prepared right now. Uh, we are uh, planning to, Mass Health is planning to include a request for the authority to make subcapitated payments 
to primary care practices to cover CHW salaries. Uh, sustainability in Massachusetts is really not yet achieved, but we're hopeful that more sustainable and stable funding will be possible in the new waiver for providers and ACOs to pay for increased hiring for CHWs for care coordination. So um, I, I, that's really what I wanted to sort of get across that that um, that all these pieces really needed to be in place. Although I don't, I think nationally we have moved in that direction. So much of it is in place for other states to do an uptake. Uh, along the lines of what we uh, we have done in Massachusetts, and we're excited about the next phases. Thank you so much. Next slide. Here's my contact information, and I'm going to turn it on now over to Carl, who's going to give us some more examples of um, of of great work going on in other locations. Thank right. you. Thanks, Gail. Um, I'm really delighted to be with you all today. I know you all share our, our passion for. Uh, many of the same issues. I, I want to preface what I'm saying. I'm going to introduce a couple of specific models. There are a lot of different models out there. As Denise's remarks and Gail's uh, would suggest, this is a very complex field and it takes it takes a while to dig into it. States are going about it in very different ways from one state to another. I want to thank uh, Dr. Wong for posting in the chat a link to our sustainable financing report, which Denise showed on one of her slides. And I also want to very quickly give a shout out to uh, some of our colleagues from the CDC who are uh, on this uh, uh, on this call uh, with us. And they have been for the last 10 years plus uh, behind the scenes, I think, for the most part, doing some great leadership work in promoting uh, the field of community health workers generally and financing specifically, including some of the work that a group of us have done with ASTO, whom you'll hear from in just a minute. So I'm going to talk about two specific models. Uh, the first one, we were asked uh, specifically to show some examples of, or an example of blended funding, because uh, it is clear that a single source of funding is very seldom going to do the job um, for financing community health workers. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is because some of some of the limitations uh, in the current availability, the current available funding sources that Denise has pointed out already. This is a model called Pathways Community Hub. It has considerable history. Um, it can it includes a hub organization or backbone organization that is responsible for the overall coordination of the system, but the actual employers of the community health workers are. Uh, as is so commonly the case, Denise pointed out, community-based organizations and not healthcare providers. But the community health workers have uh, broad flexibility to address the expressed needs of families. And they can work on a lot of issues that are non-medical in nature uh, because of the blended nature of the funding that they receive. Uh, they have, uh, one of the key features of this is that the uh, the CHWs are equipped with protocols called pathways, and it not only helps to guide their work and document the work, but it also is a vehicle for uh, payment from multiple payers, and this is really crucial. And so the, the payers often commonly do include Medicaid from the state or from health plans, uh, but also entities like housing authorities, school systems, even criminal justice. Uh, systems and it's so it's very flexible. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a diagram which shows mainly the the multiple payers at the top and the multiple partners involved in delivery of care at the bottom. So as you can see, that golden circle is the CHW, who's really the the linchpin of the whole thing. And the hub receives requests for CHW assistance from a variety of sources around around the top and then uh, makes a referral to one of the employer organizations for CHW to work with that particular family. Next slide, please. The original model for this was in Ohio where they worked on birth outcomes where, and they achieved some really dramatic results. They started out in census tracts that had some of the highest rates of infant mortality and low birth weight and premature deliveries. And they uh, they flipped the scenario such that 
those census tracts were uh, equal to or better than the state average in those measures within a few short years. The model has now been uh, implemented in more than 20 states. It's growing constantly. And I would, I, I should add here I, in the interest of full disclosure that the parent organization of this program is now a company called Care Coordination Systems, and they are a major financial sponsor of the National Association of Community Health Workers. Um, but that had nothing to do with the, uh, uh, the request for a, a description of a blended funding program. One of the examples uh, that I would cite in Washington, where they are doing demonstrations of accountable health communities, you can look that one up if you, and many of you are familiar with the concept. Uh, there are nine of those, six of them employ community health workers, and four of those sites are implementing the pathways model. Uh, so the, the results were not available in the published uh, literature for a long time, but they have, um, uh, were finally published in 2014 and have gotten a lot of attention. Uh, it, I would point out that implementation is not simple. As you can imagine, this, this model can be pretty complex to implement at a local level, and it does require some initial grant funding to establish the, the partnerships and agreements necessary to, uh, uh, to make it work. Plus the integration of their documentation system and their billing system with electronic health records. And they've been pretty successful at making that integration work, but also the entire system requires training above and beyond whatever core training uh, may be required under state level standards. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is, you can review this at your leisure uh, later, but this, summarizes the role that is played by the pathways or the protocols, um, which forms the backbone of their, their IT uh, platform, and the community hub, which is the crucial organization at the center of it all. Next slide, please. I wanna share with you an example of, this is a sort of generic uh, model of what one of the pathways looks like. And it shows that there are discrete steps along the way that the community health worker, worker is expected to follow, but they have latitude to deviate. They just, in, in order to document progress, they need to record uh, actions uh, under each of these steps. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, and so at, at each of these steps, the progress uh, triggers a, a progress payment uh, from the payer source, but this is all managed by the hub organization. And so the, the completion step in order to consider a pathway to be completed, uh, there has to be a measurable outcome. And so in the case of pr a pregnancy pathway, obviously a healthy full-term delivery is the outcome that everybody is working toward, and that that triggers a uh, a very substantial uh, completion payment from the the payer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I'd also like to talk briefly about another model. Medicaid is obviously the uh, uh, the the elephant in the room when it comes to financing. Um, it is where most of the money is, and there are. Uh, at least 10 states so far that have some form of official Medicaid financing for community health workers. There's a lot of stuff going on, you might say, under the table, uh, informal arrangements, particularly with managed care organizations who are employing or paying for community health workers uh, uh, without, let's say, asking either forgiveness or permission. Uh, they're just doing it because they know it's, it's worth doing. But New Mexico is an interest, a very interesting example. Uh, managed care, which is uh, most states now are operating at least partially under managed care financing for Medicaid services, uh, is um, the contracts themselves can be a vehicle for financing community health worker services. And uh, a number of states have done that in addition to New Mexico, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, and Michigan 
have have used Medicaid the Medicaid managed care contracts as a vehicle for um, authorizing or paying for uh, community health workers. Next slide, please. In the New Mexico model, this is basically uh, payments from the Medicaid managed care organizations to providers and other organizations to do care coordination for people with complex needs. And this is based on a pilot that was initiated by Molina Health Many of you are familiar with them. They are a prominent player in the Medicaid program around the country. And they wanted to focus on some of their members who frequently use the emergency department for care. And those are people who commonly have uh, multiple needs and uh, often are the highest cost members to the health plan. This is an example of what I would call the low hanging fruit in terms of the opportunities for Medicaid to pay for community health workers. Uh, assisting people with complex needs is now very prominently regarded as an, uh, an area, number one, an area of need in the Medicaid program, but number two, an area where community health workers can make a big contribution. There are several organizations now nationally that are working on uh, promoting better care for people with complex needs. And the, uh, this uh, pilot reported their results in a journal article in, in 2011, and the state of New Mexico has adopted that program um, now uh, making, it, making it statewide. Uh, I would add that Molina Healthcare, uh, based on these results, also took it to other states where they have Medicaid contracts. Uh, and the... Uh, the original model as implemented in New Mexico was that the health plans made uh, similar to what Gail just described, subcapitation payments to providers uh, per member per month payments to deliver these care coordination services. And uh, some of them have decided for their own reasons, business-wise, to make these payments on a fee-for-service basis to these providers. The uh, and I would add that the state has uh, found it necessary to, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, stimulate uh, further activity on the part of the health plans, uh, mandating an increase uh, of the number of patient contacts by CHWs just a few years ago. Uh, the similar pattern was followed in Michigan where they, they uh, health plans were mandated to provide a certain number of FTEs per so many thousand members. And the, the state has gradually ratcheted up that ratio, uh, requiring more delivery of more services by CHWs. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the original paper, if anyone is interested uh, uh, in, in this, uh, please uh, reach out to us and we can, uh, we can discuss it. Uh, I can't, can't offer to post it on the, uh, uh, in the chat because it's copyrighted, but uh, it is uh, very useful. It is one of the first and most often cited examples of financial return on investment from CHW services. Next slide, please. Uh, last thing I wanted to say about this is this is an example of an opportunity to look more broadly at what community health workers can do within the community. And this, I refer to this as my grasshopper slide, but um, the, uh, the darkest green area here is the kind of intensive work with people with complex needs that has immediate payoff to the payers. But where we're headed in the long run is a more integrated and full spectrum, if you will, uh, array of services by community health workers, not just to the people with the greatest need, but across the community to build, as Denise referred to, community resilience which is the long-term, uh, one of the long-term strategies for addressing health equities to build that community resilience. I will say that uh, a couple of the authors of this paper, which is cited at the bottom of the slide, are the same folks who uh, contributed to the original pilot in uh, New Mexico. So again, this is just one example of how Medicaid has approached this and uh, perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about this a bit further in the panel discussion. 
So um, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Georgia to uh, uh, to take over moderating the panel. And thank you all very much. Thank you so much, presenters. Uh, just amazing content, uh, clearly demonstrating all that's gone into uh, looking at um, sustainable financing for CHWs and so much more to come. Before we transition, though, to the panel, I'd like to give Anna Bartels um, from ASTO an opportunity to share their policy work on CHW sustainability or sustainable financing. Anna? Hi, um, thank you so much for including me today. It was wonderful to listen to the panel and it's an honor to be here. Um, I represent the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials or ASTO and we're the membership association for the public health secretaries and commissioners in all 50 states, DC and the territories. Um, I wanted to speak briefly about why we see state and territorial health officials as players in this, but I think essentially I'm just gonna echo a few themes um, from our panelists. Um, so state and territorial health officials and their staff um, can be an asset in getting grant funding, both to pay for uh, chronic disease prevention, infectious disease, family and child health, but as Gail has demonstrated also to support the infrastructure for community health workers, uh, such as by supporting state associations and coalitions. Um, public health also is well positioned to act as a nudge for Medicaid or other payers um, to, include, to improve financing for community health workers. Um, they're also leading or contributing to statewide workforce studies and acting as a convener, both as a bridge to other sectors or agencies but also um, to create platforms for CHW leadership and policymaking. Um, but that's obviously not enough uh, to achieve sustainable financing below. So I wanted to call out a couple of things that I thought were really uh, important from the panel today. Um, the first was just echoing that when we talk about different ways to finance community health workers, it, the opportunities that we see or call out often center on healthcare. Um, but payers are often motivated by healthcare cost savings and community health workers go so far beyond that. Um, I think right now, especially, there's a really clear illustration of the value of having trusted agents in the community with the current COVID response and recovery. Um, that's something that's been lacking during the current pandemic. And we've also seen that you can't just build that community connectedness or trust overnight. Um, it really shows that this is a long-term relationship with community health workers and not something that you can just tap into um, without nurturing. Um, and second, sustainability is also about the quality of the job. Um, as we're talking about hiring community health workers, there need to be full-time positions with both benefits and career advancements. So that could look like mental health supports for frontline workers during a crisis, um, it could be paid time for training or time to be out in the community building relationships um, rather than getting reimbursed for specific outcomes. Um, it includes having supervisory or other roles for community health workers to grow into to stay involved in the public health or other systems. Um, and then as Gail called out is also about the creating the infrastructure for CHWs to have self-determination. So that's creating their professional identity, being involved in policy making. Um, if community health workers are hired in healthcare settings, um, that is especially important in preserving the true nature of community health workers, not just being care coordinators or providing certain services, but really making sure that when we say community health workers, we're talking about people who have lived experience, are connected to the communities, and are that relationship builder, not just a coordinator or a specific task provider. Um, so again, it was an honor to listen to the panelists and um, I'll pause there for discussion. Oh, thank you so much, Anna. That was, that was amazing. Uh, and thank you for honing in on very specific uh, critical items that need to be considered uh, uh, as we talk about uh, financing strategies. So, you know, I'm going to uh, ask a few questions. Uh, it's for the, the panel. Um, and one is thinking about, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of best practices shared, including policies and performance um, metrics that um, 
states uh, are using. Um, and I'd like to ask you all, how are these success stories being shared across jurisdictions? Uh, excuse me, jurisdictions. Uh, are there any key partners we should bring to the table? And are there any uh, potential lessons learned from other professions or even other countries? Uh, we know the history of CHWs is very long and it spans the globe. Uh, so any insights you can share would be really helpful. Well, I'll just jump in and say um, there, there are not enough environments and opportunities to sort of share what's working well. Certainly the pandemic has brought to the fore relationships, partnerships, um, you know, co-mentoring and sort of co learning collaborative um, that have uh, at least elevated or amplified some of these opportunities. Um, but, but it's a challenge and it's a challenge for a variety of ways. You know, a, a lot of times I hear people speak about CHW programs and I sort of wonder, sort of wonder what that really is. It is difficult um, and highly unadvisable from my perspective and the perspective of the profession. I would imagine the panelists here to take a program that was designed for a particular population in a specific health system or in a nonprofit in a specific geography. Uh, with a, a, a specific way of financing and try to say that this is a model that we can now place in 500 different communities. It's very important um, not only to have the local strategy and the co-leadership of community health workers, but to ask the essential question. So when folks ask, how many community health, health workers do we need? You know, I've seen reports saying we need a million community health workers. We need 100,000 community health workers. And my response is always, to do what, where, with whom, for how long, with what impact, right? And, and so again, what we want to do is we want to respond to the unique context, assets, and deficits that communities and populations experience. The last thing I'll say is that ASO, uh, as well as many other partners, have come alongside NACHWA to help amplify many of the community-based um, assets and opportunities. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're a small organization, but through these partnerships with the CDC, CHW work group and others, we are able to both listen to the needs that are happening at the state level and uh, the assets and the approaches and then disseminate those. So I, again, I think that this co-learning is uh, really rising during the pandemic and I hope it continues. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Gail and then Carl. Okay, just really quickly, I'll, I'll point out the work that <clears throat> you yourself, Georgia, are involved with here on the regional level to, um, you know, Georgia's really kind of, uh, HHS Region 1 is really supporting us to, um, to build a regional identity and to do that learning across, uh, across the six New England states. And CDC is supporting it through its uh, 1815 funding. We're gonna be hosting uh, uh, state think tank conversations around financing over the course of year four of 1815. So um, I just wanted to like let that, you know, Pete, that's, you're an important partner and so is CDC and, um, and just to point that out to folks across the country. Thank you, Gail. Yes, and it, it has been important conversations about the cross jurisdictional aspect uh, of the work. Carl? Yeah, I, I think you hit on a really important question. We've heard about a lot about this and, and Gail and I and, and increasingly uh, Denise have been getting a lot of inquiries about, you know, what what are other states doing about so and so or what are best practices in in establishing CHW services and and so on. There's a, a great hunger out there for that. I want to in, in it just starting with the policy environment, which is a big mm -hmm. consideration here that we know that um, ASTO and also the National Academy for State Health Policy have web pages associated with um, the, the current state of policy development around CHWs uh, around the country. But uh, we all know from, from experience how hard that is to stay on top of, to keep it current. So we're actually meeting the three organizations, NACHW and the other two, uh, to talk about how that we can collaborate on on keeping that information more up to date, 
Um, NACHW also has a document resource center on policy with um, over 900 documents about what other states or state level groups have done in developing or designing state uh, state level policy. We're uh, proposing now we have a plan to expand that to include uh, research documents or evidence based uh, mm -hmm. creating a searchable database, but also employment practices because a lot of organizations are saying, you know, uh, what should the caseload be for for right. community health workers or what are wage levels like? Uh, uh, what is the appropriate supervision span for uh, mm -hmm. working with CHWs? Things like that. And mm -hmm. um, and so we're we're looking to attract some support to build out that uh, that capability as well. People do want to learn from each other mm -hmm. about how to do this right, and and it and it does need to be as you can see from from Gail's presentation in particular. It takes considerable effort to do it right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Anna, did you have anything you wanted to contribute at the moment? Okay. No. Great. So I'll ask uh, one more question because I do want to leave some time for audience questions. Uh, and so this is future thinking um, around uh, sustainable financing. So Carl, you highlighted the pathways model, which uses a braided blended funding approach. In the panel's opinion, how critical is multi-sector and or braided blended funding for achieving sustainable funding for CHWs? Should we look at Medicaid and other health sector uh, partners for much of the solution to this funding issue, or should we branch out more? Yes, we should. <laughs> so yes, to 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 all of those. To to be brief, let let's just go back to what it is we're trying to achieve, right? You know, I'll give a very uh, concrete example, which is during the pandemic, there were five million individuals who had lost their jobs, they lost access to health insurance and were eligible for Medicaid and did not enroll in Medicaid. We know that when adults are Medicaid eligible and they're not enrolled, if they have children, often those children do not receive services, right? So there's a cascading uh, effect um, that we have to address. Um, health insurance literacy, access to health insurance, enrollment in health insurance that is continuous, it is a determinant for health and well-being, um, but most CHWs do not um, are, are not integrated right into that infrastructure, and we don't have a continuous infrastructure just to ensure health insurance enrollment. Um, we have to reach deeply into community. We learned that over ten years ago with the Affordable Care Act and that successful enrollment. So we have to think holistically about prevention. We have to think holistically about the social drivers of well-being, and yes, that should bring partners, public and private, to the table across sector to consider what um, those key indicators are uh, that will help us prevent downstream chronic disease, um, misdiagnosed or undiagnosed behavioral health, keep people in safe and affordable housing, ensure that people have access to primary care, which can drive immunizations, and other well child appointments um, for individuals and families. So that's why I say, yes, Georgia, let's do what we can now, but let's come together on what it is that we're trying to achieve, which is health equity. Right. Yeah, thank you so much, Denise. Any um, other brief comments from our presenters panel members? Okay. Hearing none, and I hate to, to rush the process. Clearly, this could go on for probably another two hours, which would be great, but we don't have that much time. So I'm going to take just two audience questions. One was shared by uh, Betsy Rosenfeld in Region 1, and she is interested in whether the need to establish an, an ROI has diminished over time. In other words, why are CHWs held to the standard of needing to save money and achieving better outcomes? After all, the regular medical care system is not held to this standard. Two minutes. <laughs> and yeah, I would say right now that is that that has not diminished. Let me just echo uh, Betsy's comments. Um, this is something that, for instance, PCORI is working on with its comparative effectiveness research and its CHW portfolio. But we still see that even those uh, effective interventions lack uptake into health systems and services on a continuous basis. So sometimes it's not even the ROI 
that is driving continuous uh, and sustainable financing of CHW um, services. So the problem exists. I also just want to echo what she said, that it is very inequitable to require ROI mm -hmm. when you're funding a program for six months, one year, 18 months, and you're looking at persistent and systemic uh, barriers uh, to achieving health and well-being. Um, why CHWs are held to that standard when they don't um, enjoy the same sort of status as other health professions. We lack codes, we lack integration, we lack uh, data infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I understand the sentiment, um, but the infrastructure is just not there. Um, and as I mentioned, because of all of the other reasons, it comes down to an issue of just being inequitable um, and, and unenforceable because we're not really putting what we need behind it in terms of resources to ensure that we can actually measure return on investment. The last thing I wanna say, which is that uh, CDC is, is in support of a project called the Common Indicators. The Common Indicators is really uh, endeavoring to drive best practice in evaluating CHW programs and services. And I think we also lack uh, some indicators and evaluation metrics that can really ensure we understand what is it about the CHW program that is unique what is it about the services um, that is really driving the return that we're looking for? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna move on to one more audience question. Um, has there been discussion, this comes from Corstella Johnson as well as Damian Kilsbeck. Has there been discussion about partnering with public health credentialing offices or training centers funded by HRSA to assist with, with developing a standardized certification of CHWs? Is it a feasible option? Yeah, two minutes. <laughs> yes, Carl. Yeah, real quick one. Uh, credentialing is a sensitive topic and it is uh, not something that community health workers or their advocates uh, uh, embrace automatically. It, where it has been established, it is voluntary but it um, it really needs to be where it is established needs to be responsive to the specific needs of this profession. And so I, I don't think, I think there's so a deep skepticism out there about doing anything standardized nationally. And, um, and so I think uh, uh, perhaps it may be best to leave well enough alone that uh, as long as CHWs are driving the process, in establishing state level credentialing or deciding whether they want to have it at all, uh, then the professional will get what it what it needs. Um, but I think it's um, I think it's perhaps not the most appropriate strategy to think about be thinking about national uh, national standards, certainly not at this point. Yes, yeah. Yeah. can I sit for a minute? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so um, I wanted I wanted to say that um, as a state, we're developing reciprocity guidelines with other states. So that would be the first step. Uh, if there's national certification, is many years beyond my lifetime. I think. I believe um, because of the reasons Carl said, and I also would add that we are working closely with our public health training center on CHW trainings that are appropriate for Massachusetts certification and continuing education. Thank I'll you. So add quickly yeah. that uh, number one, the American Public Health Association CHW section has policies on workforce development that require uh, that workforce development conversations have as an added leadership and decision-making body, at least 50% of CHW or promotora leadership. In other words, um, we do not want other professions uh, to be sort of dictating to us what is our scope of work. Mm -hmm. The second I would say is that across all of our states and territories over many, many decades, CHWs and promotoras and CHRs have come together to develop their trainings and core competencies. And so we want any sort of state-based or national endeavor to build on the assets of the CHW leaders of the community of practice. The last thing that I would say is for many years, I worked in the AHEX as an HIV outreach worker. What community health workers do need is investment of an infrastructure that creates career pipelines, that has exploration programs, that builds on the expertise of folks who have been doing this for many, many decades. And I think if we have that sort of 
infrastructure, what will rise to the fore are the core competencies, the qualities, the unique attributes that are across BHWs, regardless of ethnicity, geography, or the sector. The C3 project has articulated these. They've been nationally endorsed by many CHWs, promotoras, and CHRs. And so again, we want to build on the assets that come from the profession. Thank you. Thank you all. We are at time. And I think just to put hopefully a little bow on this, it's nothing about us without us. That is what you're saying. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wong to close us out and take us home. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. What an amazing uh, session. Uh, lots of great information. I heard a lot of great practical ideas that I'll continue to think about and work with our partners on. And, and I want to thank uh, Georgia for, for a fantastic job moderating. And of course, uh, thanks to all of our um, 80 plus almost 90 hundred participants for today's session. I saw folks from OMH, from Office of Regional Health Operations, from many of our sister federal agencies, CDC, SAMHSA, CMS. I saw many others. Thank you all for participating. As I shared earlier at the beginning, this is a, a new priority for OMH. We're going to be reaching out to many of you to have discussions and thinking about how we can, you know, amplify these efforts that we heard about today and others and really look forward to, to this partnership. Uh, many folks have asked about recordings and slides. I put it in the chat, but just for a reminder, this session has been recorded. It will be on the OMH YouTube channel in a few days, and you'll be able to share that with others. And we will be sure to share a set of the slides as well by email to all the attendees. So um, thank you again for attending this very special brown bag, our kickoff session for our new OMH priority in CHW financing. We hope to have other uh, public events uh, or, or outside OMH events. So please stay tuned and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much.